Franz Timmermans, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you very much. Can we really build a world that's greener now that we're coming back up to speed and industry is going to be you know, manufacturing again? All of these initiatives that the EU has sound very positive and hopeful, but manufacturing still needs oil and fossil fuels. Well, we have a unique opportunity to build back better. We will have to build back after the pandemic, uh, but let's do it better. Let's make sure we use this opportunity to invest in green technologies, to decarbonize our economy, to create a circular economy, to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. We can all do that right now. It's easy to say though, but from an outside perspective, looking at uh, Asian companies, some of them think that the new green deal is really just a form of protectionism. It certainly won't be. Anything we do will be in conformity with WTO rules. Nothing will uh, lead to protectionism. And what I see also in Asian companies, I was in Korea the last couple of days, visited Hyundai, is they are committed to turning around their industries, to making them sustainable, to creating new forms of mobility. It's a really an exciting time. But if you're putting tariffs on things, if you're saying, OK, that's not very green, so we don't want that, isn't that the same as saying, you know, we don't want that industry, we're not going to have it? The only thing we're going to do is to say when an industry moves to decarbonize, um, that we avoid the risk of carbon leakage, which means that the industry would leave the place where it's decarbonizing to produce the same thing in a dirty way elsewhere. Then the planet doesn't profit from our from our uh, efforts. So we have to avoid what we call carbon leakage. Um, and that's the only goal of the measures we will take. It is not a protectionist move, on the contrary. We want to encourage other players to move in the same direction. And I find it fascinating that because the European Union is considering what we call a carbon border adjustment mechanism, our partners worldwide have questions and want us to explain why, and at the same time ask us, how could we avoid that? Well, my answer is very clear, by decarbonizing. We have to do that anyway. But if it costs them more to produce whatever they're producing, it makes it more expensive, isn't that ending up being a penalty on them? Well, the fact of the matter is that if you count the cost of carbon and what that's doing to our planet, uh, decarbonizing costs less, not more. It, it, only if you don't count the cost on our planet if you don't look at what's happening worldwide, if you don't see the heat in Northwest Canada killing people, if you don't see the wildfires everywhere, if you don't see the droughts, if you don't see the monsoon that seems to drag on forever, if you don't want to see that, then of course you only calculate the cost of production. But you also need to calculate the cost of destroying our natural habitat. And we need to avoid the temperature to rise more than two degrees. It's, it's about our survival. But what about jobs and people who are particularly at, you know, really poor paying jobs? They may not have a choice in this. They may have to take a job in a company that isn't terribly green and hasn't decarbonized because it's a choice of having food on the table or not having food on the table. You're penalizing them, aren't you, as well? Well, we're not because we're creating new jobs. We've calculated for Europe that transitioning to a sustainable economy will deliver two million jobs. And of course, other jobs will disappear. So we will have a huge task in skilling and reskilling our people to take the new jobs. But the jobs will be there. Our task 
both of companies and of public authorities, is to give our people the tools to take up new jobs. That is going to be the big challenge. But there will be new jobs. And in this transitional period, those of us who are richer will have to take more responsibility to help those of us who are poorer to also make this transition. And in some cases, this will take longer. In some cases, this will go quicker. But we all need to make that transition. And by the way, if we don't, and things get out of hand, and we have um, less water, less food, who are going to pay the highest price? Not the rich people. They will find ways to go elsewhere. But too many people have nowhere else to go. So we need to think about them and their interests. How do you reassure uh, those of us living outside of Europe that any of these moves will not end up just being pulled back into Europe to benefit European farmers, to benefit European uh, you know, households, that it will actually be a real benefit to us? Well, you know, all of us are operating on the basis of self-interest. So let's look at it from a European self-interest. Europe is only responsible for about 8% of global emissions. We can only save the planet if the whole planet moves in that direction. If we take wonderful measures that apply to Europe and reduce the emissions at the expense of other parts of the world, other parts of the world will not make the same development and we will be nowhere. So it, only on the basis of self-interest, I say we need to make sure we take everyone along in this development. So what would you say to an Indonesian farmer? Small holding, um, he does palm oil, and he's saying, I'm really worried. I'm worried that what you're going to be doing now is going to actually drive me out of business. What am I going to do, Mr. Timmermans? What we're going to do is to work with the Indonesian authorities that in the long run, we will have a sustainable farming system. That's what we're doing in Europe. We need to help farmers produce in an ecologically acceptable way. This, applies to palm oil as much as it applies to other crops. And we, ha we need farmers because they also have to become more custodians of our natural environment because many of the solutions for the climate crisis will be nature-based. We need carbon sinks, we need healthy forests, we need healthy peatlands, healthy grasslands. And for that, we need farming communities. So there is also tremendous opportunity for farming communities in this new world. It's been a long-running dispute between Indonesia, and Malaysia and the EU. Is it going to be resolved? I think in the long run it will be resolved because I see willingness on all sides, including in Indonesia and Malaysia, to think in terms of sustainable production of palm oil. What do we need palm oil for? Um, is it, I think there is a case to be made that in certain cases palm oil in food is better than other sorts of oil. But also we have to be careful that we don't create huge problems of deforestation through uh, palm oil. You know, we're in Singapore. In Singapore, you've seen the smoke coming uh, from uh, other parts of uh, the world uh, into Singapore because too many um, fires were going on. This is so bad for our natural environment, and it's unnecessary. There is something like a sustainable palm oil production, and that's what we need to strive for, together with our partners in Indonesia and Malaysia. The whole issue, though, of using palm oil as a biofuel, is that going to recede in any case because of the fact that we're moving to electric cars? So that whole kerfuffle is really, if you like, perhaps a little out of date now, some analysts would say. Well, we will need uh, future um, uh, sustainable biofuels. So not the first generation, perhaps not even the second generation, but third generation biofuels. Without biofuels, we're not going to get to climate neutrality because in the long run, in certain areas, it will take much longer to decarbonize. And planes on batteries, 
I don't really see it happening. Um, uh, ba uh, for planes, you will find fuel cells, uh, hydrogen could be a propellant in the future, etc. But in the foreseeable future, we will also need blended fuels and biofuels will be, have to be used for that, etc. So there is a useful market for biofuels also in the foreseeable future. So uh, I don't believe you have to exclude it uh, completely, but they have to be sustainable. We cannot produce biofuels at the expense of destroying our primal forests. These are the lungs of the earth. We cannot afford to lose them. So what I understand, though, is you're saying that palm oil may be OK for certain kinds of things like foods or maybe cosmetics, but no to palm oil as biofuel? I'm not, I'm not taking any position for the longer term on palm oil. My problem with palm oil is not what it's used for. My problem with palm oil is that the way it's being produced is a direct attack on our primal forests and on our natural habitats. And we need our primal forests. Uh, we need carbon sink, we need uh, uh, peatlands, we need grasslands, wetlands, they are essential. And if you just destroy them to produce more and more palm oil, you will be destroying uh, the potential uh, of the earth to absorb CO2. We need that. But Indonesia and Malaysia are also aware that they don't want to destroy their countries Absolutely. as well. And they would argue they just need to be given the time and also the patience that they need to have to, to change things in their own countries while still being able to provide jobs for people. Yes, and I understand that point, and we need to sit down and talk about that. Um, so uh, the European Union is open to a discussion about that. Also, my, my colleague uh, Borel, who visited Indonesia recently, also said that. Uh, so we need to, to get out of this black and white situation and to have an honest discussion about this. Palm oil will remain a controversial issue between the European Union and Indonesia and Malaysia. But there are ways of managing it and there are ways of finding a way out that is acceptable to all sides. And you see a solution within a reasonable period of time because it's been going on for a while. It's been going on for a while and it's not easy, but we have a resp collective responsibility to find solutions. Next year, the year after, <laughs> I any, don't know. any timeline? I don't know. This is very, very complicated. I just want you to know that we at the European Commission are committed to finding a solution that is acceptable to all sides. Climate change skeptics, though, say all of this is not measurable. When do you think you'll be able to say, no, it is actually measurable? We can see in, let's say, five years' time or ten years' time that sea levels haven't changed so drastically. We aren't getting as many terrible storms. Do you think this will ever be measurable? Well, first of all, the climate crisis is here. It's upon us. It's happening. It's not something in the future. The only thing we can do is try and prevent it getting completely out of hand. But that we will be stuck with erratic weather patterns, with storms and, and wildfires, is something we will have to live with for the foreseeable future. But once we move to decarbonize our economy. At some point we will reach uh, uh, neutrality and beyond that we will start step by step removing excess CO2 uh, from our atmosphere and then things will calm down. But this is something we're starting for our children and grandchildren. I think humanity needs to rekindle this feeling that we're fighting not for ourselves but for future generations. So you're talking 50 years, 100 years, we're, we're not yes. talking about the next five years. No, we're, no, we're not going to get out of the climate crisis in five years time. What we can do is now set the scene and start to move in a direction that will get us where we need to be in a generation's time. But if we don't move now, Things are going so fast, and sometimes scientists are surprised by, for instance, the speed with which temperature rises, speed with which ice disappears. We need to move now. We absolutely cannot afford to waste a couple of years. We need to move now.
Now let's look at Europe and uh, the pandemic, because we're feeling now that there's a bit of a difference in what's happening. When I switch on the television, I see people going on holiday. Yes. While we are still uh, in lockdowns in many parts of Southeast Asia, um, is Europe being sensible or are you being foolish? Well, I think, I think we have to be careful. Um, and uh, you will see, I think, with this pandemic that we will see a back and forth of infections going down and then another variant coming up now, the Delta variant now, and then infections are going up. That's what's happening in uh, uh, Europe now. But authorities have learned, and authorities uh, and, and our population, they're learning to react to these developments in a better way than, than two years ago. So I think, I think we will be lighter on our feet in terms of decision making. Uh, society is craving to open, and I can understand that. You know, I, I also have two teenagers at home. They've missed a year and a half of their lives, and for teenagers, that's an eternity. So was it sensible to have this vaccination passport, this green travel passport, so that people could go traveling more easily? Yes, it was, because the only way we can get out of this is to get everyone vaccinated. The threat is to people who are not vaccinated. Vaccinated people might be infected and might then show some signs of illness, but it's probably not going to be life-threatening to them. Uh, people who are not vaccinated, they run a risk. So we need to speed up vaccinations. And we also need to take up our international responsibility. And something that is sometimes overlooked, for every vaccine that is used in Europe, one is exported uh, outside of Europe. So Europe is taking its responsibility also in delivering vaccines to the rest of the world. Well, WHO says nobody is safe until we're all vaccinated. Exactly. Exactly. But if we look at countries which have very high vaccination levels, like, let's say, Israel, or even some very small places like the Seychelles and so on, that hasn't stopped a lot of infections now coming up with the variants. So is the worry that what's happening now with all the travel in Europe and the football mashers, uh, all the sporting, big sporting events, are you looking at something really terrible happening in the autumn? Well, it hasn't stopped um, the variants, but it has stopped people going into ICUs and dying if they are vaccinated. So that already is a positive effect of vaccination. But we need to remain vigilant and we need to keep speeding up the vaccination process. Everybody needs to be vaccinated. That's the only way we can create a level of immunity that will allow us to function fully again as a society, everywhere in the world. How do you square that up though? European Union has always been a symbol of choice people having a choice and that it's a democracy, it is democratically driven with ideals which allow choice. If you're saying that everybody has to be vaccinated, then what about persons who say, no, I, sorry, I don't believe you and well, I don't want to be vaccinated? Well, first of all, we have to, we have to convince as many people uh, as possible uh, and there will always be a small portion of the population you might not reach. Um, and I feel for them because they run so many risks uh, they are the ones who will end up on the ICUs. And if, you, if, you, if that portion of, of the public is too big, then society needs to protect itself. Because if the portion is too big, our ICUs, our medical systems will be overrun. And then everybody will suffer. And we can't, cannot afford uh, uh, to do that. Uh, you know, there's, there's this uh, expression, uh, you know, liberty of the wolves is the death of lambs. You know, you, 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 have, to, you have to balance the request for liberty with a general interest of safety for the whole population. So you are saying that there is going to have, that the majority who want to be safe with vaccines may have to take precedence over those who feel that they want to not have the vaccine. Well, I think, I think we are in a, in a good situation, at least in Europe, um, where we can convince the vast majority of the population to be vaccinated. And I just feel for that small minority that doesn't want to be vaccinated because they will suffer because of that. But the amount of people that will be vaccinated is big enough to avoid a catastrophic consequences for our health systems. So I'm actually optimistic about this. And I really feel for the people who refuse to get vaccinated because they're hurting themselves. So you see that act of coming back to a normal life when? Well, I don't know what you call a normal life. I think we have to come to terms with the fact as humanity that we will be dealing um, with perhaps not pandemics, but with epidemics um, caused by COVID or, or, or variants of COVID. And, you know, the one thing that humanity is very good at is adapting. 
adapting to no, new circumstances. We'll adapt. We'll adapt. But the illusion that everything will be like before, we should lose that uh, as quickly as possible. We need to adapt to a new situation that we can start living like we want to live, but with a number of adaptations to the new situation. Perhaps we will be wearing masks more often uh, than before permanently. Perhaps we will do more social distancing. Perhaps we will hug a bit less. All these things, you know, uh, people adapt to that. I see it with my own kids, you know, they're, they're so adaptable. And that's the beauty of humanity. We are challenged, we adapt, and we overcome. But don't you think also that would also mean we're going to be less than what we were before if we're going to hug less, we're going to see each other less? Uh, wouldn't that make a massive change? Well, you know, it, it is a change. But hugging less doesn't mean loving less. Um, you know, and that's, that's how I see it. Um, you know, we will love each other just as much as we do before. We'll express it in different ways. We'll find different ways. And what about for industry as well? It's very, very difficult. Why should I, as an entrepreneur, think that, you know, I should start a business when I think that the authorities might lock me down in another two weeks or another two months? Well, the authorities then have a responsibility also to support you to overcome the uh, issue. That's what authorities have been doing worldwide. But well, the money's running extent. out. It's yes. It's gone yes, on for course. a bit long now. Of course, but we're coming back. We're coming back. Working at a distance from your working place is going to be uh, something many more people will do. Um, and we're getting used to that. So I think, you know, again, we'll adapt. I'm an optimist. We'll adapt. We'll overcome. So on a scale of 1 to 10, where are we in getting past this pandemic? Mm, six, <laughs> perhaps. That's, a, that's still past five, which is, yes. which sounds, which is good enough for us. <laughs> <laughs> Franz Timmermans, thank you very much it was a for pleasure. being on In Conversation. It was a pleasure.